we're about to start moving towards macro summer. What is macro summer? Macro summer is when interest rates are falling, inflation is falling, and growth is picking up. That's the kind of holy grail for macro and for investing. And we should be in macro summer for all of 2024 and into 2025. My forward-looking basis is that the economy picks up, inflation keeps falling. I think it'll overshoot to the downside, which is the opposite of everybody else's narrative of sticky inflation. And I think the markets are already showing you how excited they are about this idea. Rao Pao, founder and CEO of Real Vision, author of The Global Macro Investor, and the founder and CEO of Exponential Age Asset Management. It is so great to see you. And Raul, it is great to welcome you on the show. Thank you so much for joining me. It's always great to be here. You've always been part of my journey, so I'm always happy to be here. Well, I was looking. We've known each other for almost a decade. Um, 2024 will be a decade when I wrote the first article about you and Real Vision. So it has been a long time. That's and when I had, you discovered me when I had like one and a half thousand Twitter followers or something. That's right. Well, I had heard about you in macro circles and I was like, who's this Rao Pao guy and the, what's GMI that never leaks? So I'm so <laughs> glad that I started looking on Twitter. Well, Rao, I want to start where I always start with my guest, and that is to get their big picture macro view, their assessment of the economy and markets. And one of the things about this show is you can take as much time as you need to set the table, if you will. So what is that big picture macro view for you today, Rao? Okay, I'm going to step back a bit. The world hit an inflection point in 2008, which was the global debt crisis. And we get the ramifications that spread on in 2012, the European crisis. Um, and that continues to rumble on to this day. What happened back then was something remarkable. Is If we think about how GDP is created, the growth of economies, it's population growth, productivity, and debt growth. We've had aging populations in most of the Western world. The US is less aging than others, but still aging. But debt growth in 2008 stopped, basically. And we had a debt jubilee. Now, debt jubilees, most people would think of, you forgive all the debts. We didn't. We did this magic trick, which we said, you don't need to pay the interest on the debt. We'll make it all zero. And every central bank around the world cut interest rates to zero. Okay, that created an opportunity for every government to refinance their debts. So they all refinance and they refinance them in this three to five year time horizon. And that set off a cyclicality to the economy that we've never really seen before. That every four years we get economic weakness, the increases of the balance sheet and use of interest rates as they come to refinance the debt. What I found out in my work that's become quite well known called the Everything Code, I found out that, in fact, the use of the central bank balance sheets was used to pay the interest on the debt from the previous cycle. And this will become relevant in a second. So they're monetizing the interest payments, which is pure debasement of currency. And debasement of currency means that the denominator the purchasing power of that currency goes down and it makes the price of assets look like they're going up. But they're not really going up. When you divide, for example, the S&P 500 or gold or real estate by the Fed balance sheet, they've been flat since 2008. And I discovered within that process that only two assets actually have risen versus the debasement of currency. That was technology stocks and crypto. Both were in secular uptrends. So this, like clockwork business cycle, which is based around the debt refi cycle, happens to be exactly the same as the US election cycle. It also happens to be exactly the same as the Bitcoin halving cycle. So all of these cycles are at the same time every time. So here we are today. Today, we're at the bottom of the business cycle. This is the kind of recessionary era. Businesses are laying off staff. Inflation is starting to fall sharply. The, the forward-looking markets, technology and crypto, priced in a recession last year. And they've been recovering since because they've been following 
the forward-looking indicators of financial conditions and other things. Right now, stuff like the Russell 2000 and oil is living in the present day, which is slow economy. So they're at their lows. And everyone's like, what the hell is going on? Why are these tech stocks going up and everything else is going down? It's because they're forward-looking, as it is their job. So I've been very bullish. I saw the li liquidity cycle, which is the key driver of all assets. The liquidity cycle is based around this interest rate cycle, which is based around this whole debt refi cycle. Liquidity started bottoming last year in October, November, December. And that gave us the signal to start getting long both crypto and technology. And that's been you know phenomenally good. I mean, this year, what the NASDAQ's up 45% and crypto is anything, anywhere between 80 and 500% this year. And that's got people scratching their heads. But our forward-looking indicators of the business cycle suggest we're going into what is, right now we're in macro spring. That's when the weather kind of gets warmer every day, but sometimes it's raining and sometimes you've got a frost and, and other times it's hot and you're like, it's always confusing. That's macro spring. We're about to start moving towards macro summer. What is macro summer? Macro summer is when interest rates are falling, inflation is falling, and growth is picking up. That's the kind of holy grail for macro and for investing. And we should be in macro summer for all of 2024 and into 2025. And so my forward-looking basis is that the economy picks up, inflation keeps falling. I think it'll overshoot to the downside, which is the opposite of everybody else's narrative of sticky inflation. And I think the markets are already showing you how excited they are about this idea because we've just gone through a ridiculous rate cycle, kind of an unprecedented rate cycle on the back of the unprecedented inflation. That inflation, I think, was just driven by the pandemic. If you shut down you know, all demand and shut down all supply and then bring it all back on at the same point, you create chaos. Exactly the same happened after World War II. After World War II, suddenly everyone came back into the labor force and factories had to retool from making munitions to making cars and washing machines and whatever. And we got a massive inflation then. But then what happened is it worked its way through and we just had strong growth going forward. So that's where we are today. We've that, still... Go on. Oh, no, no, no. You can continue. So we've still got the problem remaining of that GDP formula. How do we pay for this bloody debt? Because it keeps going up. The higher interest rates go, the more they have to, bonds they have to issue, which is why I think they want to bring interest rates much lower than people expect by being so late in hiking so they can undershoot and have the cover to paper over the cracks in the system yet again. And they'll use like the commercial real estate and the banks as one of the excuses to do it, to start using the balance sheet. But we've still got the problems with the economy is it's not growing fast enough to pay the interest on the debt. So if the economy on average is growing at 1.75%, and let's say interest payments on debt is about 2%, and the government's 100% of GDP in debt, that's all of GDP just to pay the debt. So what you need is to grow GDP. And to grow GDP, you either need the population to grow, well, that's not going to happen, or you need productivity to grow. That's technology. So productivity growth is what I'm really looking at. And it's not this cycle story, but by 2030, we will see AI solve for both problems. AI and the robots are new demographics. They're new productive units in the workforce of infinite scale. So we can now have an infinite population of productive people people in inverted commas, and that will start driving productivity. The next part of the equation is we need to bring the, the cost of energy per unit of output down. And it won't come out of fossil fuel markets. It'll come out of um, renewable energy plus nuclear energy. If you lower the cost, the average per dollar um, barrel of oil price over the last 60 years has been about $40, inflation adjusted. But if you change to a new source of energy or bring in other sources of energy to make an excess abundance of energy and you bring it down to $40 at $10, that has a massive multiplier. So my big picture is we're about to go through an economic revolution, but we're not finished with the downside. 
of slow economies. And that's going to mean more and more use of the balance sheets, on, ongoing increase in asset prices, um, and this ongoing cyclicality of the economy. So there you go. That's In my nutshell, there it all is. Well, I love that um, nutshell. Okay. A few things I want to just explore further with you and I got to say, that was an incredible first answer. So this notion of um, entering a, we're in a macro spring, we'll be entering a macro summer in 2024, 2025, and that we are at the bottom of the cycle. And so I get the sense, like I sense some bullishness, especially um, with the liquidity cycle picking back up. So I guess my question for you, Raul, is ha- did we already have the recession? Because I have a lot of folks on this program and they keep forecasting a recession. And so I just want to hear more on that. Did we already experience it? And I guess we got through it. Or is that still in the cards? So I the answer is I don't know. Um I think we've had a rolling recession through different parts of the economy at different times. You know, truck drivers, huge recession, uh car companies, big recession. Yeah, you know, there's a bunch of indicators that show that the tech companies, don't forget, they laid off all of their stuff beginning of the year. And continuing claims are rising again. So somebody else is 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 laying off workers now. So I think it's been ongoing, but I think this quarter and next quarter will be the weakest because the ISM is at its lows and the ISM is at levels, um, which is the best indicator of the business cycle, is around 46, which has historically given us a 100% chance of recession. So I think we're probably in a recession, um, but it's been this kind of rolling recession. So I, my view is always it's never going to be a bad recession. It'll more be like 1990, which is a mild recession, but with a lot of overhangs afterwards, commercial real estate being one. Unemployment will be stickier than people expect because of the right rise of AI and other things. But I think the market's priced it in. The forward-looking market's priced it in last year. You know, Crypto was down 80%. NASDAQ was down 38%. Um, and then I think that the other markets like the Russell 2000, the oil markets, copper markets, all of that stuff is pricing it in today. Mm-hmm. And then on the inflation side of things, um, I hear you saying um, and the inflation falling. So I guess, do you think we're going to get back? It sounds like we could get back to that 2% target for the Fed. I want to hear more on the inflation side of things. Yeah. From our work, we put together, for example, the last five major inflation since World War II and then just map this current one against it. It's identical. They all kind of are the same thing. They go up and go down. It looks like Mount Fuji. You know, it's almost symmetrical. We're seeing it already in Europe where PPI numbers, Norway hit a negative 42% PPI. I mean, this is staggeringly disinflationary or deflationary. So my view is that when we see the kind of November, December inflation numbers in January, we will start to see inflation at 2% or lower. And that will continue, I think, to potentially deflation in the headline numbers. The core inflation and headline inflation is actually driven not by commodity prices and all of this fast moving stuff. It's actually driven by two things, wage increases and owner equivalent rents, both of which are going down, are deflating. And all the forward looking indicators suggest that they are likely to go negative. So I think there is a chance even of core inflation going negative in 2024, which is very much the opposite of what anybody else's view is. Most people, I think there's myself and Alex Gurovich are the only two people who, mm-hmm. who've got this view. Almost everybody else thinks we're going to see sticky inflation. I just don't think we will. Well, speaking of that, if um, and you talk about you and Alex Gurovich have that view and others have the sticky inflation You've been doing macro for a long time, um, several decades. So I guess my other question to you is, what kind of, do you see like false narratives out there in the macro space? Any that stand out to you? There's a lot of false narratives in macro and a lot of it is based on politics. People put their political views into their economic views and then create market views around them. So there's a general desire for a recession and markets to fall. And that's driven by people who are really all about how is inflation created? The central banks have destroyed our world and I want to show everybody that it's happened. Yes, the central banks have destroyed our world, but not in the ways that they think. You know, we've had the use of the balance sheet for over a decade now 
and in Japan even longer. It never generated inflation. But they want that inflation because they want to prove that the monetarism is the kind of holy grail that they worship. And it's the people who worship Volcker, for example, um, come with different angles. So people are, a lot of people are imposing perspectives that they hold from political opinions. And so the narratives become overwhelming. And I've actually gone on Twitter and said, okay, if you think sticky inflation, how do you vote? Sticky inflationists are Republicans in general. And it's just because of how the construct of how people see the world. What I try and do is not look at that. I mean, at Global Macro Investor, we have 2,000 charts. And we just try and use the data and not impose our own views on the data um, and see where what that comes out with. And that gives us the high probability that inflation just reverts back to 2% or lower. Doesn't mean I'm definitely right, but you know, it just it comfortably gives me a, a decent probability, I think. Yeah, yeah, the probability of it and um, being able to separate yourself from those, um, the political views. Uh, you mentioned in that answer that the central bank destroyed our world, but not in the ways that they think. Can you expand on that? So when you debase a currency, it doesn't let wages go up or even corporate earnings go up. It makes asset prices go up. So those who can afford assets outperform or at least protect their wealth. Everybody else who earns wages and doesn't have much assets, they get their future self an asset is your ability to put money in now and take it out later. It's future de deferred consumption. If you can't buy assets, you're getting your future self is getting poorer. That's why we have a pension system. That's why people buy real estate. That's why they buy gold. All of these things. So what they're doing by debasing the currency by whatever the number is, 15% a year, is they are mutualizing the costs of servicing the debt. But it's mutualizing it across the poorer people, which is what makes everybody so angry. Because they don't understand this card trick that's being played on them. It's the same as raising taxes on them all, but they don't realize. They just know that something's not right. Why do my wages not really go up, but everything else goes up around me? Why can't I afford a house and my parents could afford a house? Why could my parents have you know, a larger percentage in their 401k and I can't? It's because of this. And that's what the central banks are doing. Hey there, I just want to quickly interrupt the video and just say thank you. Thank you so much for coming to this channel and choosing to watch this interview. I hope that you are enjoying it and I appreciate you visiting the channel. If you like what you see, please hit that subscribe button. It doesn't cost anything. It's totally free and it will keep you up to date on all of my interviews. I post two interviews a week with some of the most incredible people in, in finance and investing and your support will help me bring in some more amazing guest. If you already are one of my subscribers, thank you so much. I cannot express to you how much your support means to me. I am incredibly grateful that I get to do something that I'm truly passionate about. And you being there week after week, it not only gives me that energy, but it just gives me that faith to keep going. And it means everything to me. And I love seeing you all in the comments section. I love interacting with you. I love interacting with you on email or social media. I just love hearing from you all. And I just appreciate your support so much. I feel incredibly lucky that I get to do something that I just love. So I just want to say thank you and appreciate you subscribing. All right, back to the interview. Do you think that... So right there, I'm just thinking like, I'm a millennial. I feel like, okay, I want to buy a house. And it almost feels like unattainable right now. I feel like I've done all the right things but the prices are crazy. And I I'm, I feel like I'm probably not the only one who s feels that. How do you see that trend? I guess maybe I'm asking the question probably, is it like the destruction of the American dream when these things like houses, cars, everything feels like so unaffordable where it's like, wait, everyone else before me was able to do this. Yeah. The destruction of the American dream has come from that, that real wages haven't really ever gone up. That's the dirty secret. Nobody really got richer. And 
everybody financed consumption by debt, which made their future selves poorer as well. And so that's been a real problem for people. So then you say, okay, the millennial cohort, what do they do about it? And I did the, that piece, that famous YouTube video called The Retirement Crisis, where I said, well, if you're a millennial, you have basically one choice, which was crypto. And that was, I don't know, 2016 or something, I did that video. And the point being is millennials are very good because they invest in their 401ks. They kind of do as they're told, but it's not enough because you can't get up the housing ladder and you can't do other things. So they, in 2020, they learned a new trick, which was risk-taking. So with their disposable income, they've been huge buyers of crypto, by far the largest cohort, because it has a massively skewed risk-reward. So it gives them a chance. The other thing they did was trade technology stocks, because they rightly identified that they go up more than the S&P 500 and boring stuff like GE. And then they started trading in with options because buying a lottery ticket for them is kind of the only choice that they've got. Now, so it is it is intelligent risk-taking because they're actually still investing in their 401ks. And that's why crypto has resonated so well for people because they can see a way out. But it's hard because it's very volatile too. But that's why it's kind of gripped the younger people as have technology stocks. That's why people love Tesla. It, it might produce amazing cars, but it also produces has produced amazing performance for people. And people need that because there's no other way because it's not going to be made up with wages. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Well, I, I hope my Bitcoin can help me with my down payment. Um, we were talking at the top of this uh, conversation when you were outlining your macro view and a key part of that is the debt problem. And I understand that digital assets are, you know, one of those solutions way out of the debt problem. Maybe to step back, can we frame up the debt problem, the severity of it, and then let's start to explore some of the ways out of the debt problem? So the debt problem is is really interesting. 2008, every major government in the world of a developed economy hit 100% of GDP in debt. So, okay, and interest rates, let's say five-year interest rates where they gen generally finance themselves, have averaged around 2% or less. But so is economic growth. So if you think of GDP as all of the money circulating around to pay for the debt, there's no more money left over. But the problem is the private sector is over 100% of GDP in debt in every major country. So who pays for that debt? So what? that's when they started shoving the interest payment debt onto the balance sheets because the world basically hit the tipping point in 2008 and people still haven't worked this out. But I think I was the first person and still maybe the only person who's gone back and calculated all of the interest payments and realized that they are and the balance sheet growth and realized that they are just three and a half years apart, the same chart. They just keep monetizing it. And that's the way that they see out of the debt is to mutualize those payments across everybody by increasing the balance sheet. But the debt doesn't go away because GDP is not growing fast enough. So you have to change the GDP formula. If not, you're in this endless trap where you're printing more and more money making the rich richer, the poor poorer, ad infinitum. And I think that for individuals, as I said, there's only two assets that outperform this. That's technology and that's crypto. Okay, fine. The economy, that's really hard to get this to sort itself out. People are waiting for a collapse, the market's down 80%. It can't. The reason it can't is the central bank debase the currency and it makes the stock market go up optically because they can't allow the collateral of the system to go bust. So they don't allow the system to go bust and it creates this ongoing problem. But if you listen to the narratives from the central banks and the governments, what they're really saying is the whole green energy revolution. Europe is massively funding this. And yes, it's good for the planet. Yes, it's good for a number of things. But really what they're trying to do is lower the cost of electricity. 
Because if you lower the cost of electricity, it has this multiplier effect on productivity. And that's how you can grow GDP growth. The other thing is population. Well, we're, we're shrinking populations, as I said, so we have to replace people. So look at Amazon warehouses. The growth is not in people. The growth is in the robots. The robots work 24-7, 365. They never complain, and they cost a fraction of a human. So every company is incentivized to employ robots to do jobs instead of humans. Then this year, we had the nuclear bomb of deflation, which is human knowledge, lawyers, doctors, accountants, creative artists, developers, everybody, and they're replaceable via the infinite knowledge machine that is AI. So that's scary for us as individuals, but if population growth is a large part of the components of GDP growth, you've basically, you can create infinite people by the robots and AI. So there are schools of thought, even coming out of Oxford University, that says we could hit a tipping point where the GDP of the planet doubles in a year or even a week. Now that sounds extreme, but if you put infinite people or infinite productive units into the economy, you can make infinite goods. Now who pays for the goods? Maybe the machines pay for the goods. We don't know. This is a whole new economic system being built in front of our eyes. This is something I call the exponential age, which is where all of these technologies are coming together from energy to AI, to robotics, to EV, to space, to 5G, 6G, all of these things, biotech, all coming together, genetic sciences, to create this fastest period of technological change in all of humanity. And it's the only way out, and it's scary. Yeah. So I want to hear more on that too, because, you know, um, I, I used to think of you, Raul, like almost a little bit more, I don't, I don't know. I, don't, I used to think of you as almost being a bit more bearish in a way, but am I sensing like, is this like making you more optimistic about this, the future? When I discovered this whole understanding, both the exponential age and the everything code that came later, it was like a veil had been lifted from my eyes. Macro guys generally tended to be mean reversion guys. They look for something to get excessive, then they want to, you know, bet against it. And they see the world like this, like the business cycle. And we, none of us could understand technology and why it kept going up. We kind of could understand crypto because it's like this macro phenomena of, you know, a whole different financial system, parallel financial system, getting adoption, et cetera. But technology, none of us got, apart from the few. And when I started dividing everything by the central bank balance sheets to take account debasement, I saw that technology was one of the things that just kept rising. And that led me to dig into this whole process. And that completely changed my framework of the world. I wasn't looking for the blow up now. I was looking for the melt up. And, you know, crypto markets had taught me that, taught me to use these logarithmic charts of these trends. If you look at the chart of Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, all of these, on a logarithmic chart, they're almost perfectly smooth trends. They're network adoption models. But when you look at them normally, they look like they go up and down a lot. Yes, they do, but within a consistent, secular, powerful trend. Once I saw that, I'm like, if our job is to make money, then this is the trend you need to be on, the secular trend, because it's driven by the central banks. It's driven by technology itself, but then also driven by the central banks debasing. So you get the double whammy from it. It's like, okay, this is perfect. And it also is the answer to the macro, massive macro problem of excess debt and slow GDP and aging populations. So when you've got something that's so against the persistent narrative that everything's screwed and it's all going to go wrong, and you see it and do a lot of you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours of research on it, and you come up with a completely opposite view. It's like, oh my God. And then I started surfacing that view for Global Macro Investor and then within Real Vision and elsewhere, and it was like a light bulb moment for people. They're like, oh my God, 
suddenly now understand why things are happening as they are, why technology stocks keep outperforming, why crypto keeps going up, you know, why people are angry, why politics have become so polarized. It all starts to make sense. And if we can make money from it, great. Yeah. You mentioned, um, you know, this being the only way out of the situation and that it's also scary. So I imagine there's this optimistic view, but there's also a darker view as well. Can you explore maybe the tension between those two, those two scenarios? The darker view is that the excess manipulation of money blows up the entire system. And that's a lot of people hold that view, that you end up with a hyperinflation or something of that sort, a total economic collapse. But I struggle to get to that answer because in every circumstance, when asset prices collapse or something goes wrong, they just print money. And when you're the world's reserve currency, it's bloody difficult to hyperinflate it. So what you end up with is this ridiculous rise in asset prices, which then gets rid of this ability to have this massive downside. So I think we've taken the big downside away. Well, we've traded it off for something else, which is everybody's incomes basically get poorer in purchasing power over time versus assets. But I, I don't see... Okay, the other downside people would say, and there's validity to it as well, is that the excess use of monetary policy creates sticky inflation. And that therefore interest rates need to be higher. But I've lived through whole periods of higher interest rates and asset prices still go up. It's just the rates of change at interest rates that matter. You know, markets don't like rates going from zero to five and a half percent in record time. But even if rates stay at five percent for the next ten years, it's not going to stop people buying technology stocks. Why? Because they're ROI is much higher than 5%, so nobody cares. And most of those technology stocks don't have debt, so they have cash. And their cash on their balance sheet is going up at 5.5% a year because they're putting it into bonds. So it's this compounding effect for these companies that is so powerful, it's difficult to change. So this, I think it's so great having you because I'm learning a ton from you and I'm taking a lot of notes. So we, if we, even this notion that we could stay at 5% um, percent for the next 10 years and it's not going to stop tech stocks going up. So I, I imagine, is it one of the other narratives out there in macro, like this whole higher for longer and folks pointing to, well, it's, it's the longer part that's the concern. Is that one of those false narratives then? Yeah. Yes. I mean, we've had extended periods of time where interest rates have been higher than 6% and markets have gone up. It's just this idea in our head. Now, it's difficult to finance the government debt because they have to keep issuing more and more and more debt to pay the interest. But I think that ends up on the on the balance sheet. So can they do that and still have interest rates at 5%? Yes, they can. It gets trickier. And I get that. And I think that's the point they start using yield curve control. This is what they did in the 1940s and 50s. They said, and Japan has just done. They're like, okay, well, we're just not going to allow interest rates to rise. And we're just going to peg the yield curve, which is another form of monetary debasement and another form of QE. As opposed to QE, which is buy bonds at any price, buy X number of bonds at any price, yield curve control is buy all bonds at a fixed price. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's another form of QE. And that would that also push up asset prices then? Yes. Okay. okay. And we saw that. We saw a over the 50s and 60s, we saw a, I don't know, 9x upside in the S&P. Same reason. You're kind of printing money. And what happened is debt to GDP went down over time because productivity picked up because we had a big technological revolution back in the 50s. You know, everybody started getting houses, cars, TVs, telephones, all of that stuff. And that, that kind of changed. Um, the economic structure. Okay. So let's also step back in this environment. And I imagine, okay. So I imagine you obviously are going to be allocated to cryptocurrencies, tech stocks. 
Let's talk about um, maybe, and you have a different risk profile from a lot of folks, but can we talk about portfolio and portfolio construction? What do you want to be in in this environment? What's interesting to you? What do you want to avoid as well? So once I started putting together this kind of super thesis of the everything code and the exponential age, I started to look at all assets versus each other to say, if you're going to take risk, where do you take it? And everything was inferior to crypto. And I'm like, it, it becomes very difficult. If you look at it, the best performing asset for three years out of four, every single year since 2009 has been crypto. And then there's one year, which is a bad down year, and then it continues. And the down year, it's the worst performing asset. But over time, it's compounded higher than any single asset class we've ever seen in history. So if that's the case, every other trade-off is suboptimal. Now, I can take that risk because I have income and I've got you know assets. So I can, I can take big risk because I think this is the biggest macro setup of all time. So I'll take that risk. But for other people... You can express some of these views without taking as much risk. You know, if you believe in the debasement of currency, yes, you can use gold, but gold hasn't offset it very well. Yes, you could be cyclical and trade commodities. You know, there'll be, as soon as we start going to macro summer, commodity prices will rise. You can make money from that. You can make money from, you know, buying banks at the bottom of the cycle. You can make money lots of ways. It depends what your objective is. If you, if you And how it came to me is it just became the big macro view and therefore the big macro bet. And a lot of people you and I know all came to the same conclusion. We've seen it, you know, Dan Tapiero, Dan Moorhead, Mark Yusko, all of these people, one after the other. Uh, a lot of them all were GMI people. We all found about it. You know, we all went through this journey together back in 2012. Um, people have just realized it, it, it is the mega trend. Now, again, it's not for everybody. You have to deal with some huge ups and downs. Um, but, you know, there are ways of playing it in the equity market, stuff like Coinbase, stuff like that. Or otherwise, I just think you're going to be underperforming the debasement of currency. So the standard, I'm going to stick my money in the S&P 500 ETF, you're just not going to get anywhere. That house price is still going to go up. And you're just not going to make it any excess returns. And that it's a really serious situation. People don't want to understand it. They don't like this narrative. They don't like to be told that, you know, most assets aren't worth investing anymore. But it's true. And just look at the price action. And even if you take crypto out because you're not a crypto person, justified any asset by the NASDAQ. Just crush them all. And then people say, well, it's going to mean revert. I'm like, what is going to stop this technological revolution accelerating? If you can find me a reason that this stops, as opposed to the business cycle, you know, rates go up, blah, 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 it comes down. I, I can't find reasons. Just when you throw AI, robotics, gene editing, space, EV, I mean, it's like a a massive structural change. So I don't see many examples. I mean, if you listen to Stan Druckenmiller, you know, he's long NVIDIA. You know, he gets it. It's like, what's going to stop this? What's going to stop Google going up? Even if they destroy their business model of advertising, they still have a lot of the technology bets. You know, people thought Meta were dead because they had a big sell-off in the bear market last year. I mean, I don't know, 300% this year. It's very hard to keep down technological advance, particularly when it's in monopolistic powers like these large tech firms. Yeah. Because all they do is they buy anybody who threatens them. Yeah. The AI side of things is really fascinating too. Um, and I mean, you could see it indiv even individually using it, the productivity um, gains as an individual, but also this notion of like robotics. And I, I know, I actually know people who are working on this like in the robotics space. Uh, I know a, a friend who's a founder working in this space. And I want to explore that a little bit with you. The AI side of things, the robotics, really exciting near term, but how about like a bit longer term? Because you know, what happens when 
people can't get jobs and the robot is doing a better job. They're not complaining. They're, they show up on time and do everything. Um, how do you think about balancing that well, risk? Well, the, the, the basic answer has been you'll need to tax the robots and increase universal basic income. But that doesn't help because humans like to do things. Um, and they're social creatures. We've now changed how the structure of societies work. They used to be, you're in North Carolina, it revolves around the people around you, your town, you know, your local locations, stuff like that. You know, it's the it's the village with a church in the middle and a bar in the middle. Is you know, that's how societies used to be. That's changed. We still have some of that, but we now have these massive online societies that we all live in based around your interest groups. And my view of all of this is that is where human purpose will reside within these digital network states, these big communities of people where we work for the community. Whether that's the community around Taylor Swift or whether it's around a cryptocurrency or it's around whatever interest that you've got, sports teams, whatever. And that's one of the big unlocks of Web3 is it allows people to participate in these communities in an economic sense. And we will see much more of this coming. And it's something that Yatsui from Anamoka Brands called universal basic equity. If you think of Facebook and their WhatsApp and Instagram and all of those things, we got to use those products, but the shareholders got rich. The Web3 changes that equation is the users can get rich too. And that becomes really interesting because you can own a part of the network. Um, so I think there's something around this that is where the world will go because humans do want to socialize. They do want to help each other. They do want to have competitive spirits. They don't want to sit at home and get paid universal basic income. They want a purpose. And if your purpose can be promoting Taylor Swift, great. And if you can make money from that, great. That may be even more fulfilling than going to a bloody factory and pressing buttons all day or greasing a machine. But it's just a, it's a structural change to humanity. Much like we could have gone back and said farm workers ended up becoming factory workers. You know, Societies do change, and then factory workers ended up becoming people working in restaurants and service industries. So there's no difference. It just it's going to happen faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and speaking of the timeline, I think what I was listening to you earlier, just going back to the AI, like, saying by like 2030, I think, and I don't want to like misquote you, that we'll really start to see this massive difference or take hold. I guess I want to hear more on like the timeline side of things, and I also want to throw in crypto in there because it's been. Um, You've been in crypto since, what, 2012 when you first started exploring the space? I just want to hear your thoughts on the pace there. Has it been faster or a little bit slower or right on par with your expectations on the crypto side of things, maybe the broader adoption? Even we can throw in the in institutional adoption. Yep. So crypto side has been, outside of AI, the fastest adoption of any technology in all of humanity. It has been following a perfect log trend. And what was it staggering is last year, the number of active wallets in crypto grew 42% in a year when the market went down 80%. That's like, oh my God. We're now at 516 million users. By the end of... 2030 will be well over a billion users, maybe 2 billion users. So it is a very prevalent technology and it's happening this cycle everywhere, it's kind of everything everywhere all at once. The banks are using it. They're already trying to settle securities on it. They're using it for payment systems. We're seeing Visa using it for payment systems. We're seeing mega brands like Mercedes-Benz or Starbucks using Web3 NFTs. We're seeing Hermes, you know, LVMH as a broader company adopting this. We are seeing the 
ongoing adoption globally of cryptocurrency as an investment vehicle. We're seeing the institutions investing in it. You know, I've had on my show Texas teachers. You know, they were pioneers in the space. We've had um, Franklin Templeton, Fidelity. I mean, these are big companies. Now we got BlackRock. So what is going on here? Here's a nice way of framing all of this. And it makes it easier for people who are kind of crypto cynical or don't really understand it. We have two worlds. We talked about this before. We have the physical world that we live in, your world of North Carolina or my world of the Cayman Islands. And then we've got the digital communities that we live in. The crypto, crypto land and fiat world, are these two worlds. Now, we talked about GDP is slow in fiat world because of aging populations, debt, and lack of productivity. But over in crypto land, the population's growing at 42% a year in a year when the economy went down 80%. You've got productivity improvements as new uses of blockchain technology get introduced every day. And you've just wiped out the debt from the previous cycle. So you have a extremely fast growing emerging market and what happens is you're now seeing fiat world participants set up offices in crypto land Franklin Templeton fiat um Franklin Templeton fidelity TRS they're setting up offices there so we, we love this place we think it's a dynamic economy we want to build stuff here then the ETF comes along the ETF people need to think of as a trade deal between fiat world and crypto land. So it's a trade deal to allow capital to flow into this other economy. And as that economy, crypto land grows fast, a lot of money is going to go down through this pipe of the trade deal, which is the ETFs, and then will flourish within that economy. So we're seeing this giant sucking sound of people seeing this economy. It's much like when China came onto the world stage. Is everybody flooded there? Everyone put their capital there. Everyone built offices there because they could see the big opportunity. Well, this is the fastest growing economy we've ever witnessed. It just happens to be a digital one. It has its own system of currency, its own interest rates and central bank policy. It has a financial system, which is DeFi. It has states like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, whatever it may be. These are states within crypto land. And those have different policies. We have taxation systems within crypto land. We have assets, NFTs, within crypto land. And it's just because they've all been more attractive over time, it's sucking in more and more of fiat world into it. And eventually, I think it basically subsumes fiat world. That's a fascinating way to think about it. Um just one quick question. You pointed out like um, the number of wallets growing. I think you said 42% when the market was down 80. And it just makes me bring up this as a, more of a curiosity, especially as someone who's been investing for decades. How do you manage the psychology when you go through these periods? I know you've been in um, so you know, Bitcoin gonna, for... Okay. I'll give you my story because yeah. I've learned. Mm -hmm. So I first saw Bitcoin 2012 and I wrote that that macroeconomic strategy paper on it. It was the first one ever written about Bitcoin, how to value it. And I said, listen, I think this thing could be worth, if, it's, if you value it in the same way you value gold, this thing's worth a million dollars. That's right. And let's assume I'm an idiot, discount myself by 90%. It's worth 100 grand and it was trading at $200. I'm like, this is the best macro risk reward I've ever seen in my entire career. And so I bought it then, as did many of my kind of global macro investor people at the time. I wrote it up and it went up 5x very shortly afterwards uh, and then collapsed 87%. My time horizon, however, was long. I'm like, this is an option. It could go to zero because it was still very early days, but I think it could be worth 100 grand and this should be a 10-year bet. So that was the idea. So like goes down 87%. I didn't have a massive amount, a few percent of my portfolio in it. It's like, fine, okay, we'll see. By May of, 20, of 2017, I was up 10x from 2012. 
from my original entry. Having seen it go down 87%, I was now 10x from my entry. I'm like, okay. And then there was a lot of confusion in the space about forking wars and stuff I didn't understand. And I could see it was like ramping up. I'm like, I'm just going to take profits. Great, great trade. I thought, I'm a god. I'm like George Soros here. I've just nailed it. It then goes up another 10x into this frenzy into the end of the year, that spectacular bubble of 2017. And I was fine with it. I'm like, I've made 10x. I'll leave it to the next person. You know, Novo became the billionaire out of that trade. I didn't. Um, but, um, and then the market fell and it did its usual 85% round trip. And we continued to educate people via real vision about it. I still thought it was a, but I hadn't lost my faith in the idea. What I'd done is screwed up my time horizon. I didn't think that I, sh I should have kept it for the 10 years, but I didn't. So then all well and good. I see the pandemic, crypto collapses. I buy back in at six and a half thousand and still hold it to this day. It went up 10x, come down, going back up. Great. Made a lot of money from it. And then about a year ago, I went back and said, what happens if I just kept my original bet, which was much smaller, I'd have made five times as much money. And I traded it well. I, I bought it low, sold it high, bought it into a dip. I would have made five times as much money. And then I thought, I always show the log chart and these business cycles in the log chart. I'm like, what happens if I just added my original investment every time it got to one of these business cycle lows? I would have made 25 times as much. I'm like, I completely screwed it up, even though I did well from it. So this time around, I knew we were going to get a down cycle. I didn't get the top. I thought it was going to go higher, whatever. It's irrelevant because it's the down cycle where you add that makes you all the money. So I spent all of last year buying Solana, Ethereum into the massive sell-offs because then you compound much faster. So you should be embracing the volatility if you've got a long-term view. If your view is one year, five, uh, one year, three years, three months, it's much harder to deal with. It's so volatile. But when you just zoom out, use the logarithmic trend and don't freak yourself out, which is why I've tried to be the voice of reason on Twitter when everyone's freaking out. It's like, we've all seen you know, FTX goes bust. Yeah, Mount Gox won't bust. Mm -hmm. We've seen this. We've seen that. It's just noise. Ha does Has the adoption of this technology changed or not? No. Keep going. And that was it. So it's just a, it's a psychology change of understanding long time horizons. And I've found that long time horizons are a superpower. Yeah. Because most people can't do it. Yeah. Wait, did you ever ac actually look at what the actual number figure would have been? I did. And it's... it's it's not good. You don't have to share. Um, I probably have time for one more question. And maybe I'm looking at our notes. And again, so great to have you oh, all right. around. I'm going to ask you a question about AI because you asked me that question, the acceleration of AI before okay. this one. This is even faster than crypto's adoption because it's built on top of the internet rails that already exist. And there's zero barrier to entry apart from just paying open AI. And then Microsoft are going to put into every single one of their products. It's going to get to a billion people by, you know, by mid next year. So the acceleration of this technology plus the improvements of the technology itself are exponential squared kind of. It's like we've never seen anything like this. No technology has ever improved at this rate. So it becomes very difficult to forecast. Yeah. Because we just don't know. No, we just don't know. It's fascinating. It's so fascinating. Um, it does make me want to ask like maybe one final question. Um, and I've heard you in the past talk about uh, the fourth turning. I actually had Neil Howe on the show just a couple months ago. And I, I, I just want to bring it up because I want to hear, you know, how does all this kind of fit into that? Do you still buy into that framework? And is this maybe the way out of the crisis this, period, out of the fourth turning? This is the fourth turning. We're building an entirely new system. We're building an entirely new structure of the economy. And the fourth turning was never going to be what people wanted. It's what happened. You know, 
a lot of people think of the fourth turning and they want to go back to the 1950s and other people want some other variation of it. But what's happening is in front of our eyes. We're building an entire parallel financial system at record speed in front of us, built on top of the internet. And then we've just built this knowledge monster on top, this new kind of god. So within this is a new system. How that works? I have no idea yet. I can see the crypto side. That's pretty straightforward. How the rest of it works? This is the fourth turning, and this is the answer for the other side of it. And like all fourth turnings, it's going to create an enormous amount of friction, fear, misunderstanding, but eventually optimism. Well, Rao Pal, it has been an absolute pleasure. I want to give you a few moments to talk about Real Vision. I'm a proud paid subscriber um, to Real Vision. Can you let folks know more about the offering? Also, anything else that you want to bring up in this conversation that we didn't, where folks can find you? I know on X, um, formerly Twitter, you just crossed a million followers. Congratulations. So just take the next few moments to do so. Thank you. Look, Real Vision, most people know the story of Real Vision. We we built it to democratize the very best financial knowledge. But nowadays, we think the world has changed and people need not only just the knowledge, but they A, they need to learn how to learn. So we built education. We have the incredible content on Real Vision with the world's most famous investors, analysts, strategists, all of that. All of my kind of theories, it's all there. But then we realized we needed to build a lot more because we built a community and we built the best community in finance. And they're in 120 countries and there's tens of thousands of them paid members and then about a million and a half others. So we're like, okay, let's create one place for everybody to live their financial lives where macro can meet crypto, can meet technology on a kind of open discussion forum where people can really dig in and learn. So we built this new Real Vision platform, which is groundbreaking. We've got AI embedded, so it can summarize videos for you, explain stuff. You just go through the transcript. The transcripts are in real time as you go. You just highlight something like, what does reverse repo mean? And the AI translates it for you. Or if you say, hey, listen, I, don't, I haven't got time to watch this hour-long video. Explain it to me like I'm five in 10 bullet, bullet points. We then have a notes section where you could just clip that and it saves it to your notes, and then you can keep all of your research together in one place. So now you've got this superpower of knowledge and tools. So with tools, we've got AI, obviously, but we've also got pricing, charting, analytics, and you know, your ability to put port portfolios in. And then we've got this network. The network's the multiplier effect because this, we've got this gorgeous 3D map of the world where I can go to any city and see who the Real Vision members are. I can talk to them. I can connect with them. It's like... People in finance used to have Bloomberg to do this, but this is a whole new way of doing it. So we've created this amazing new platform and it's free to use. So there are various different tiers, but just go to realvision.com and just see, we've reinvented how people can live their financial lives. So we've gone from being, you know, we were the people who invented long form media in finance. Then we had the written research side and now we've changed the game all over again. I love it. And it's been incredible to watch the journey of you and Real Vision and just the impact you're having on folks and teaching us and helping all of us get better. So Rao Pal, founder and CEO of Real Vision, author of Global Macro Investor and CEO of Exponential Age Asset Management. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. And Rao, great to see you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julia. As ever, total pleasure.